I'm going to talk about the results from uh, a data collection exercise that uh, we at Epic India ran in partnership with Chintin. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any uh, causal impacts or, or, or you know, behavioral uh, insights. Uh, this is purely uh, descriptions that come out of a new data set that we've generated. And the question that, that we um, sort of had when we, when we met Bharati and, and Chintan is, what happens to e-waste in Delhi? We, we hear a lot about this as, a, as an emerging problem in this country, but there's very, very limited uh, evidence. Um, and so uh, this is the question, okay? Now, India is the world's fifth largest generator of e-waste. Uh, nearly all of it is believed to be processed in the informal sector. Uh, in recent years, the government of India has tur turned its focus towards e-waste. Uh, they revised the e-waste management rules most recently in 2016. Uh, but there's very limited evidence, uh, like I said, on even the most basic patterns of how e-waste is aggregated or traded in the informal sector. And much of the existing literature in uh, microeconomics takes place in developed country settings. Um, very little has been done here uh, in India, and, and I think Shivani is, is, is part of a new wave of researchers doing work here in Delhi. So the e-waste management rules 2016 uh, introduced or revised or improved this, uh, this concept of extended producer responsibility. So producers who sell products in, in, in India should be responsible for channelizing uh, their products at the end of their useful lives towards authorized dismantlers and recyclers. And what they do in the e-waste management rules, which I'll refer to as EMR 2016, is they identify 21 categories of e-waste in Schedule 1. Uh, each product category is assigned an, uh, an average life, and, and producers uh, need to meet an increasing uh, schedule of targets that increase each year. And they suggest uh, some novel approaches to meeting these targets. For example, they, so they, they recommend that producers work with uh, PROs, or producer... Uh, producer uh, responsibility organizations. Uh, but a question that we had was how can these rules and India more broadly encourage cleaner recycling in its large informal sector, uh, which is historically a very entrenched and large group of people that have been working uh, on this stuff for a long time. So that in this presentation, I'm going to try to shed patterns uh, or shed light on, on new patterns in the sector and highlight areas that could benefit from future work. So this is a, a figure that comes from a, a Chintin report called Learning to Recycle. Sort of shows you what happens to e-waste. Uh, it's generated by households or bulk consumers. It's collected, segregated, dismantled. Precious metals are extracted. Some parts are taken out for refurbishment. You know, um, it's a very complicated sort of process. And we're really interested in, in this chain here. Who are the folks who are working on these activities? And what are they actually doing? in the field. So what do we often hear about the sector? Well, as I mentioned, um, there are somewhere between 25,000 to 85,000 people in Delhi alone engaged in the sector. The majority of e-waste is generated by the government, public and private industries. Activities are concentrated in a handful of famous clusters like Sealampur, Mustafabad, where illegal and dangerous methods are commonly utilized to extract precious materials. Child labor is common. These are the things that we, we hear, but very, very little data actually exists on any of this sort of stuff. Now, when we started this exercise, we had to make a decision. Who, we're gonna run a survey, but who do we actually survey? How do we define them? So we, we defined uh, something that we'll refer to as e-waste enterprises, as small businesses that engage in collection, dismantling, repair, and refurbishing of electronic waste. Uh, typically, these are kabadiwalas, but these are the ones that have uh, fixed shops or plots where they could store their, their materials and, and, and work on them. And most of the people in local neighborhoods know of these people. So this is how we define it. And here's examples of collection activities here in Delhi. Um, you know, here's some refrigerators, some televisions. This is what happens when the products are dismantled. And what, as I mentioned, what we wanted to do was generate uh, a new data set on e-waste enterprises. Uh, so what we did is we actually uh, uh, enlisted teams of surveyors to get onto motorcycles and drive through every single street in Delhi uh, looking for these e-waste enterprises. And whenever they found an e-waste enterprise, they would stop them and administer the survey. Right? And, so th and, and this is an example of a survey taking place. 
And uh, this activity went on from roughly July until November of last year. And so a lot of roads were covered. Uh, and this is really the first comprehensive data set of, the in, of you know, any type of informal sector activity in Delhi. Uh, okay, so I'll jump into some of the key patterns that emerged from the, this, this, this uh, activity. And, and you know, this is the first time I'm presenting this, this work. Um, it's one of Epic India's first projects in the waste sector. So I'm very curious to hear questions from the audience or insights that you might have, things that we might have missed from our interpretation of this data. So uh, uh, I'll, I guess, summarize this in, in five facts. The first fact uh, is that Delhi's e-waste market is large, uh, but it is more spread out than we initially expected. Um, now, in our data, it suggests that roughly 12,000 people are working in Delhi's uh, informal e-waste sector. So this does not include Gurgaon or Noida or some of the other surrounding cities. Um, but this is substantially lower than the 85,000 estimate from the Asocham report. Um, so that was quite notable. 95% um, of the observed e-waste enterprises were collecting and dismantling e-waste. So, you know, the, the chain, the diagram that we showed you was very distinct in terms of the activities that were taking place. But the truth is that the, in the informal sector, people just do anything that can make a profit. So if it's collecting and pulling out valuable pieces before selling off that piece, that's it's, it's very blurry. The lines between each uh, activity are very blurry. Now, less than 1% admitted to using burning or acid you know, to recover valuable materials. And this is one of the common you know, narratives in this sector is that dangerous uh, activities are taking place. And it could be that this type of stuff was hidden from us as the surveyors, or it could be that this type of stuff is concentrated in some parts of the city or actually concentrated in parts of UP or other places. Here's a map of, of the coverage. So each of the blue dots here uh, re reflects an e-waste enterprise. And you can see here that um, when we started this exercise, we, we had identified five of the famous clusters. Mustafabad, Silampur, Turkmen Gate, uh, Mayapuri, Shastri Park. Uh, but there was a lot of e-waste uh, activity happening just all over the place. And this is reflective of the <coughs> fact that everyone uses electronics and <laughs> So electronic e-waste is being generated sort of everywhere. Now, when we look at the data and, and, and the characteristics of these e-waste enterprises and the entrepreneurs that are running them, we actually see differences between those businesses that are uh, based in these market clusters and the ones that are based in uh, all of the other areas. And some of these differences are not surprising. Um, for example, uh, when we look at the monthly aggregation value, so we were collecting data on uh, the kinds of products that were being collected and dismantled, the prices at which uh, uh, the enterprises were obtaining these products. Uh, the aggregation value in the market centers is you know, more than five times higher than uh, in the non-market areas. Uh, the non-market enterprises are more likely to sort of engage in every step of the chain whereas there's more specialization that happens in the market. The non-market enterprises are more likely to source their e-waste from residential users uh, compared to the market, and this suggests maybe that the, a lot of the bulk generator e-waste goes to the markets, or maybe they're actually importing some of the e-waste from, from abroad. Uh, market businesses are bigger, so there's some key differences here um, that, are, that are notable. Uh, in the, another difference, for example, is that in the market clusters, 46% of the enterprises were focusing on just a single product. So you'd go there and you'll see these family businesses where all they're doing is, is dismantling you know, miniature circuit breakers. And there's a huge mountains of M MCBs inside their homes, and that's all they're doing all day. So the specialization that's happening. Now, another interesting thing is that we looked at Schedule one. So this is, these are the, the items that are covered in the Ministry of uh, Environment's e-waste management rules. There's 21 items here. And what this shows you is the share of e-waste enterprises that reported collecting and dismantling and trying to recover material from these types of items. And what you'll see is that a bunch of items that are formally regulated were never even seen on the streets, right? Like, uh, 
user terminals. I had to Google that to find out what that was, but this, these are like computers from the 80s or, or something. Uh, pay phones, cordless phones, answering systems, right? Like these are very old and obsolete electronics are the ones that are showing up that are actually regulated. Um, of course, a lot of stuff is in this section. These are white goods. Uh, that's, I, I guess, uh, what the, the sort of called on the streets with televisions, refrigerators, washing machines, ACs. A lot of this stuff ends up in the informal sector. And that's because a lot of the IT stuff uh, goes, is valuable, and so it's being picked up by existing PROs or it's being picked up by, by the recyclers. Right? So there's some cherry picking that's happening. But what was interesting was that there was a whole category of other items that we were observing quite frequently, like music systems, stereo systems, and kitchen appliances, fans, other things that should be considered e-waste that are completely excluded from Schedule 1. So one immediate observation from this exercise is, hey, the e-waste management rules should revise their list of regulated items to cover what's actually being released onto the streets. Now, um, when we look at the data, 69% of all of the e-waste that we observe falls into these categories that are covered in, on Schedule 1. The remaining 31% are not covered. And as of August of 2018, there were roughly six PROs uh, operating in the Delhi region, such as Cairo Sambhav, e-waste recyclers, India, Terra Pro. And of these uh, six major PROs, only one of them had a notice on its website that it was it was act receiving uh, e-waste, you know, across all categories. The remaining, the others were mostly <coughs> saying that they do laptops and mobile phones, the things that have uh, PCBs and, 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 and could be, uh, were more valuable. So they were not actually taking these things. So um, this was quite interesting because it immediately points to some revisions that could be made uh, to the rules. Fact four is that prices vary widely across the informal sector, except for certain types of mobile phones. So these are uh, histograms showing you for five different categories of products, mobile phones, desktop PCs, televisions, refrigerators, air conditioners. Uh, the range of prices that people were rep reporting to pay to procure that e-waste. So, uh, and what you see is that there's prices are sort of all over the place except for phones where almost every phone costs 20 rupees. And um, when we look at, at, at uh, each product specifically, um, we, we also uh, describe certain products. So first we collected data on any generic mobile phone. Then we described different features of phones to see if the prices were different. And it turns out you can't, or you could see on that side that uh, Key phones, so the, like the old ones, these are almost uniform in price across the city. But once you get into the touchscreen phones, the prices are more variable. Refrigerators, uh, even when we describe specific features, the prices were still variable. And the same story with air conditioners. Uh, and, and we spent a lot of time thinking about what could be causing this price variation, right? Uh, we thought, okay, what if we looked at each ward, so there's 270 some odd wards in Delhi, what if we looked at average prices for different products in each ward, are there still differences? And we find that there are. And so what this suggests is that there are, you know, at the same point in time, spatial differences across the city, like you could have a product that is more expensive in one part of the city than another. And that really struck us as bizarre. And so what we tried to do is we tried to uh, take these ward level prices and um, see to what extent we, can, we could uh, explain this price variation with standard uh, uh, sort of uh, forces, uh, competitive forces. So uh, what these are each column here is a regression, a linear, simple you know, linear regression where the left-hand side variable is the ward level price. And on the right-hand side, we have quantity, local competition, distance to the nearest mega cluster, population, um, you know, e-waste activity. And we're trying to see if any of these things are explaining this, uh, you know, crossword variation in prices. And we don't actually find very promising regression results. So there's no st stars are a good thing if you're a researcher. We don't see any stars here. And what we, and we should see very low R-square. And what I think is, is happening is that 
there's tons of price discrepancies in this field, in this area, and it's likely to be driven by things that we did not observe in our survey, such as product condition. You could have a laptop that is newer and has more valuable components. You could have another laptop that is older and perhaps stripped of its components. So there's a question of at what point does a laptop cease to be a laptop? <laughs> Uh, if it's missing certain components, is it, is it, does it still have the same value? And this is important because the e-waste management rules rest on this, this idea, this EPR rests on this idea that you could commodify electronic waste. But electronic waste in this setting where there is this massive informal sector that will look for any way to turn a profit, you know, when e-waste is passing through their hands. In this setting, there's a lot of great deal of heterogeneity <coughs> in product characteristics. And so could this actually be a commodity and could EPR work here in the same way that it works in other developed countries? Now the fifth fact that we, I think our data makes clear is when we compare informal sector prices to uh, prices offered in the authorized recycling sector, or so the formal sector, we see huge differences, right? So for uh, these are the same five products, again, mobile phones, desktops, television, refrigerators, air conditioners. For air conditioners, uh, informal sector, you could get twice the price uh, in, from the informal sector for your air conditioner than an authorized recycler. And when you have a price gap like this, that actually uh, is, you know, observed across all of the different product types, it becomes very hard to imagine how uh, the authorized recyclers could compete uh, with the informal sector in terms of shifting e-waste dismantling from that sector to their sector. So um, I think I'm running out of time, but this is a, a, an overview of the, of the five key facts I wanted to, to, to show you. Um, I think our conclusions from this are that um, uh, particularly because of the formal and sec informal price gap, um, we may need to see additional policy revisions to the existing e-waste management rules. For example, higher penalties or more aggressive targets or more rigorous auditing of the credits that are issued by authorized recyclers can all create upward pressure on formal prices. Um, you know, again, uh, the, you know, this, this point, I think, is something that, we, that deserves more discussion and thought, but how do you commodify e-waste in this uh, setting where there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in product quality. And uh, these sort of points, these, these uh, conclusions, I think, point to the need for, for further research that we are, uh, um, that others a, as well as us are, are working on developing uh, to understand how the informal sector can participate more broadly in the official e-waste margin rules uh, and how things like non-monetary or monetary incentives can encourage informal sector players to shift material to authorized recyclers or implement cleaner uh, uh, practices themselves. Uh, so this is the end of my presentation. It's just it's, it's a descriptive presentation. And I think uh, what, it, what we learned from this is that there's just so much we, we still don't know about the sector. And uh, like the others have mentioned, in order to develop effective policies, we first need to understand uh, the, the, the context uh, better. Thank you. <coughs>